Boy, that's loud. <laughs> that's what, yeah, give the heads up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we seem to have stabilized um, at 48 people, so I'm going to assume we're ready. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sherilyn Orba, the head of the Department of Asian Studies at UBC. And I know that we're all dialing in from all sorts of places, but I just wanted to acknowledge that UBC is on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We are very happy that you could join us this afternoon for uh, what I'm sure is going to be an amazing talk by our colleague Ryuko Kubota from the um, Department of Education, the Faculty of Education, the, I get this wrong every time, LLED, Language and Literacy, I'm sorry, I, I apologize Ryuko, I should have looked that up, but uh, she does fantastic work. I think this is going to be a wonderful talk on this beautiful autumnal afternoon. So I will uh, turn this over to Christina Laffin. Thank you, Sherilyn. Um, I want to welcome everybody again to this session on confronting racism in Japanese language and education with Dr. Yuko Kubota. Uh, I'm Christina Laffin. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Asian Studies, and I usually teach about pre-modern Japanese literature and culture, and I serve as um, the chair of uh, the Canada Research Chair in Pre-Modern Japanese Literature and Culture. So this year I'm leading a seminar on teaching Japanese language through literature, and we were very excited and eager to invite an expert, um, Dr. Ryuko Kubota, on critical pedagogies to present today and to discuss this with all of us. Uh, and so I wanted to remind us at the outset that we're here to talk about anti-racism in language teaching and learning, and just as we aim to foster an inclusive and respectful and welcoming environment in our classrooms, we need to make sure that we're doing that here. Um, we have a diverse audience, multiple intersecting identities, differences in ability and race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status and age and position and gender. Uh, and many other forms of difference, whether they're visible or not. And so we really want this to be an inclusive discussion, which enables us all to think about our own teaching and learning. Uh, and we ask you to have that in mind as we proceed in uh, a very respectful and, and uh, inclusive manner. Um, and if you see any problems, you can of course reach out to any of the moderators or me. So let me tell you how we'll proceed. Uh, I'll introduce Professor Kubota and invite her to present for about 40 minutes. And we ask you during that to mute your mics and ideally your cameras just as you're standing by and listening. You can type questions at any point because you may forget. Um, you can type questions into the chat and I will uh, note that and I will pass them on to Professor Kubota. Or um, because we're a relatively small audience, there's about 55 of us now, uh, you can also unmute yourselves at the end and voice your questions. Uh, this session is being recorded, but if you are um, recorded, I will make sure we have your express permission to have that included um, before we post anything. So if you're not, um, you know, don't hesitate to, to ask directly. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kubota, who is a leading expert on critical pedagogies in Japanese language education. Uh, Japanese language education. She's really a foundational figure in the field of critical applied linguistics. Uh, as Sherilyn has told us, she uh, works in the Department of Language and Literacy Education within the Faculty of Education at UBC. She completed her PhD at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, which is at the University of Toronto. And then she taught first at the Monterey Institute for International Studies and later at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill before we luckily had her join us at UBC. In her scholarly work, uh, including research and publications, and in her community engagement and activism, uh, Dr. Kubota really pushes us to consider the ideologies and uh, politics that underpin language teaching and learning, and the way that power relations function in reproducing privilege and marginality uh, and inequalities. Her scholarship draws on critical race theory, post-colonialism, uh, and it helps us think about culture and multiculturalism, particularly what multiculturalism means in Canada and in the language classroom. Uh, and uh, to consider race, racialization, anti-racism, and the policies um, beneath globalization and neoliberalism. I won't tell you much about her publications because she has so many, but just so you keep an eye on future ones, 
uh, very soon from um, the open access journal Japanese language and literature. She'll be publishing um, an article and I'll put this in the chat for you so you can note it, fostering anti-racist engagement in Japanese language teaching. Uh, she also has um, over the past year published an article in language teaching uh, titled race and language teaching. Um, and last year in 2019, in Applied Linguistics, um, she published Confronting uh, Epistemological Racism, Decolonizing Scholarly Knowledge, Race and Gender in Applied Linguistics. She also has in the works from Palgrave, a co-edited book, um, which is called Discourses of Identity in Japan, Language Learning, Teaching and Revitalizing Perspectives. This year, um, Dr. Kubota was honored with uh, an award, the Distinguished Scholarship and Service Award from the American Association for Applied Linguistics based on her ongoing career uh, and distinguished contributions. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ryuko Kubota. Thank you very much, Christina. And um, thank you very much, Sherilyn, uh, for inviting me um, to this um, event. And I'd like to um, acknowledge that um, I'm on the traditional ancestral and um, uh, unceded territory of uh, the Muskan people to join you in this um, very um, exciting event. Um, so, um, just some uh, uh, disclaimers and thanks. Um, well, um, I'm using this computer um, that's uh, brand new and it started to run uh, just about 50 minutes ago. So I'm just hoping that everything will work um, perfectly. Um, if not, I have a spare computer that I um, borrowed from uh, my colleague, Sandra zappa um, who really helped me this weekend about this um, techni uh, technical issues. And also I would like to thank Yuya Takeda um, for um, uh, help me, helping me with um, videos uh, that I'm going to use in this presentation. And I'd like to uh, really uh, thank Xiaodan, uh, who is um, IT um, uh, staff who really helped me in the last um, three days um, to help me uh, run this um, new machine. But anyway, so um, let me begin. Um, when Christina actually asked me to 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 present this, um, I thought it was in, in Japanese. So I started to prepare my PowerPoint in Japanese. So uh, you will probably see some uh, Japanese words and um, materials, but um, don't worry. Um, uh, I'm going to explain everything in English. So, um, okay, so let me begin. Um, so this is my outline today. So I'm going to um, uh, share with you an episode from the media, okay? And then I'm going to discuss uh, the concept of race. And I will um, talk about different forms of racism and pedagogical implications, including and pedagogical principles and anti-racist language education and conclusion. So this is our plan today. Okay. So this is um, a, a recording of a press conference held by the Minister of, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in August um, in Japan. So what you can uh, you see here is Mr. Uh, Toshimitsu Motegi, um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Ms. Magdalena uh, Osumi. Um, who is a reporter from the Japan Times. Um, I took this uh, picture of hers from another website um, since she doesn't appear in this um, video, okay? And in this exchange, uh, Ms. Osumi asked Mr. Motegi about the coronavirus policy of the government um, that had banned long-term foreign residents in Japan from re-entry to Japan once they had left, whereas Japanese nationals were allowed to re-enter um, to Japan. So um, she was, and, and also this um, ban uh, for foreign residents was going to be lifted. So she asked a couple of questions. And um, the second one in question was the scientific evidence behind this ban. 
So for your information, uh, Ms. Osumi is originally from Poland. She became interested in learning Japanese at, at the age of um, seven when she watched Shogun, a TV drama series. She majored in Japanese at a university in Poland. While she was at uh, Gakushu in Women's College or University as an international student, she developed a professional connection and eventually found employment in Japan. So let's look at this video. Whoops. あの、え、ま、入国規制が、え、外、え、外国人を対象にした入国規制が緩和される方向であるというふうに伺ってるんですけれども、その方向性の中には在留外国人は日本人と同じような、え、ま、それらに対応な条件で入国が認めるようになる
partners with the Japan Foundation to promote Japanese language education in the world. The failing to use Japanese in a respectful manner in public with a former learner of Japanese undermines the ministry's effort. Actually, um, I sent um, criticism um, to Tokyo Shimbun, Tokyo newspaper, and got published um, in early September about that. So from this ex ex uh, example, uh, many questions came to my mind. So why did he ask the question in English all of a sudden? In other press conferences that I watched online, he responds always in Japanese, even when he's asked questions in English by foreign reporters. So those questions are um, previously submitted um, and then they are um, translated into Japanese. So that's why he's able to answer in Japanese. Another question might be, um, did he really have good intention in thinking that English was better for communication? He denied that he was not insulting her, but then why did he ask at the end, did you understand my Japanese? Why did the reporter feel that she was treated like an idiot? And would Mr. Motegi react the same way if the reporter was a white man? Or if the reporter was an Asian woman uh, with an accent? So to um, think about that question, um, let's um, imagine that this person was a reporter. Okay, I took this from a 7-Eleven Japan website. Okay, let's imagine that she was a reporter and uh, how would Mr. Motegi uh, react to her? えっと、私は現在、IT so um, as you see, she, um, her Japanese is very fluent as well. Um, but uh, would Mr. Motegi respond in English to her if she was a reporter? So, um, sorry, and Next page, um, it's necessary for us to recognize the multi-layered nature of discrimination and underlying assumptions. So we may call it intersectionality. The example that we just saw appears to be linguistic bias. But um, what happened may be a combination of multiple factors and biases, including race, gender, nationality, and so on. So the assumption underlying the bias um, include uh, white people are English speakers um, and they are not Japanese speakers. In contrast, people who look like Japanese or closer to Japanese are Japanese speakers. This also leads to the expectation that industrial trainers like um, Ms. Um, Bajaracharya, I think, um, are um, expected to, to speak Japanese. Another bias is gender related, right? So the belief that women are not legitimate professionals. So perhaps Mr. Motegi's response um, that it was well intended was unproblematic for him. But is this justified? Why does the Minister of Foreign Affairs um, collaborate with the Japan Foundation to promote Japanese language um, education overseas? Whose interest is served? 
So from this questioning, uh, we can see how the experiences of Japanese language learners or users are influenced by interlocking identity categories, including race, gender, language, class, nationality, sexual orientation, and so on. So um, today I would like to um, uh, specifically focus on the intersectionality of race and language. Um, because a large amount of uh, research has been focused on English language teaching, I will draw on examples of English and race today. So um, here's a question for you. Um, who is a native speaker of English? What image do you have? Do you think this type of person as an English speaker or this type? this type of person or this, okay? So the question is, who is often uh, regarded as a legitimate speaker of English? Or even, what is the typical image of a Canadian? You can see how the perceived racial identity may influence our idea of uh, the legitimate language speaker. In applied linguistics, um, we discuss this topic in terms of reverse linguistic stereotyping or racial linguistic ideologies. Before discussing reverse um, linguistic stereotyping, we first need to understand what um, linguistic stereotyping is. So um, it is a phenomena uh, where a certain linguistic Q uh, evokes a particular group of people in a stereotypical way. So for example, if you hear Black English, then you think of a Black person. Theoretically, any person can speak Black English, but stereotyping works in that way. So let's listen to this informational video, okay? So in this case, uh, racial uh, discrimination was triggered triggered by accent. So let's listen. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Can I ask a few questions about the apartment on Park Street? What was your name? My name? Uh, my name is Juan Hernandez. It's been rented. Oh, it's gone. Hello, my name is Sanjay Kumar. I am calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's not available. Not available? Hello, my name is Tyrone Washington. I'm calling about the apartment on Park Street. Just been rented. Hello, I am Chen Ling. My name is Khalid Bin Ali. I'm Tuan Vo. Hello, my name is Moshe Goldberg. I use a wheelchair. It's gone. Not available. All right. Thank you. Yes, hello, my name is Graham Wellington. I'm calling about the apartment for rent on Park Street. Is that still available? Yes, it is. What oh, is? Yes. Really? Housing That's discrimination wonderful. is illegal. If you think you've been a victim because of your race, color, national origin, sex, religion, disability, or family status, call us. Fair housing. It's not an option. It's the law. This is interesting, right? Because um, on the other um, side of the, the, um, the, the phone call, um, the person doesn't see uh, who is speaking. So um, this really um, uh, demonstrates a linguistic stereotyping. And this kind of uh, filtering is also called uh, linguistic profiling, right? So now, um, re reverse linguistic stereotyping works in an opposite way. So it is a phenomena um, whereby the perceived speaker's race influences the listener's perception of the speaker's uh, proficiency and skills. So uh, Okim Kang and uh, Don Rubin has been, uh, have been doing a lot of research um, um, to show how students, um, particularly in the US, um, are made to believe that a lecture um, uh, given uh, by a person of color like her, in this case, East Asian woman, um, uh, hear more accent than a lecture supposedly delivered by a white person uh, like this. Um, even though um, these students listen to the, exactly the same recorded lecture. We're not going to listen to these um, today, but 
So um, this means that race um, does matter in communication. So even though you speak a perfect language um, due to your race and gender and other categories um, that does not fit the stereotype, you are not treated as a legitimate, legitimate speaker of that language. So you can apply this concept to the language that you teach. You might teach Japanese, you might teach Chinese. Um, you can just imagine how this works in your own situation. Okay. And um, this type of racial linguistics um, uh, stereotypes are reproduced in um, teaching and textbooks. To illustrate this, I will show you um, the characters that appear in a few junior high school English textbooks in Japan. Okay. So um, these are the textbooks um, used in Japan. And as you see, um, these characters look uh, quite diverse. But let's um, focus on the ALT, assistant language teacher, native um, English speaking teachers. This person, that person, this person. So far, they're all uh, white uh, women. And only this textbook um, has um, a face with uh, shaded um, color. And uh, this person happens to be from Canada. Okay. So um, imagine students look at these illustrations almost every day for three years in junior high school, right? So how about uh, Japanese language textbooks? Okay. So let's focus on uh, the teachers. Okay, so this is interesting. Is we see more uh, male teachers than female teacher, but they all sound like they are typical Japanese teachers, right? Okay, Japanese nationals, right? And uh, Japanese teachers can be um, other Asian teachers or white teachers, any teachers can be um, uh, Japanese teachers, but the textbooks uh, portrays traditional uh, Japanese nationals as um, teachers. Okay. So here um, we see uh, racial linguistic stereotyping associates uh, Japanese speakers with ethnic Japanese people, um, English speakers with white people, and thus uh, white people cannot be Japanese speakers. And Asians, um, other than Japanese people, are perhaps expected to speak uh, Japanese rather than English. So these assumptions uh, seem to affect the ways we interact with people as demonstrated in the exchange between Mr. Osumi, uh, uh, sorry, Ms. Osumi and Mr. Motegi. In other words, um, the ways we communicate is determined not just by language, it's shaped by complex intersectional, intersectionality of language, race, gender, and other social categories. And factors. So let's take a look at the concept of race more closely. So first, uh, we are going to take a look at the concept of race. And then second, um, we will uh, discuss the concept of racism. So uh, what is race? First, um, race is a social con uh, construct uh, rather than biologically determined. So um, this is uh, because the genetic makeup of all humans is 99.9% .9 identical, according to research evidence. It's a human genome um, project, right? So for example, um, it's often believed that Asians inherently uh, excel in math, but actually um, they're socially, culturally, and institutionally expected to do so and they tend to fulfill that expectation. Another stereotype um, is that um, Black people are fast runners. Actually, uh, they do dominate sprint events and um, there's some scientific evidence that people of West African origin are genetically advantaged. 
but do black athletes from Nigeria, Senegal, uh, Sierra Leone, and so forth predominate international sports event, sprint events? I'd say no. So here, uh, too, economic, social, and historical factors greatly influence uh, the racial representation of the athletes. Actually, this topic might be of interest uh, for your class um, to talk about um, the racial um, uh, representations and imbalances in uh, various sports events like you know, swimming, uh, figure skating, basketball, and so forth. So um, we can say that uh, racial differences um, that we perceive are not biologically based, but socially, economically, historically, and ideologically constructed. But racial difference in appearance is real and it becomes a cause of uh, discrimination. So let's take a look at uh, the issue of racism. So what is racism? We need to understand racism that functions in different forms. Racism usually evokes um, individual racism or racial micro microaggressions, which um, uh, is uh, defined as everyday intentional or unintentional racial insults. But what affects us even more is institutional racism or systemic racism or racism in our social structures as seen in employment, uh, education, healthcare, housing, criminal justice, entertainment, and so on. So recent uh, Black Lives Matter movement has illuminated the structural problems that uh, perpetuate uh, police violence and mass incarceration of uh, Black uh, people in the United States. Moreover, what is often overlooked is epistemological racism that impacts our knowledge production and distribution and consumption. I will give you an example of epistemological racism, but before doing so, I would like to stress that we need to recognize that all these forms of racism influence uh, with each other and shape our views and experiences. Okay, so uh, for example, um, epistemological racism. Um, when I was a child, my favorite uh, school subject was music. So I was so excited to go to a music classroom that looked like this. I didn't think about this then, but now I realize that what's on the wall are all white European male composers. This racial, um, cultural, and gender bias um, is unconsciously ingrained in my image of what classical music is. So uh, we can say um, that in Canada, uh, too, um, white Euro-American uh, cultural uh, perspectives tend to predominate the curriculum and textbook over non-white histories or ways of knowing in schools. In Japanese language teaching, uh, the mainstream Japanese culture and history exclude uh, experiences and perspectives of indigenous peoples, ethnic minorities, including Zainichi Koreans, and newcomers and so on. And um, how about the knowledge uh, represented in our research, right? So we can ask questions like, uh, which theoretical framework do we use in our research? Who do we cite for papers? Do we see any racial, gender, and culture bias? So uh, we can see uh, minoritized groups complicity uh, with racism that oppresses them or us, me, <laughs> right? So to give you an example of complicity, I will um, introduce Metika Welba, um, the indigenous vis uh, visual artist from the Swinomish and Tulalip peoples of coastal Washington in the United States. 
So she engaged in Project 562, where she took photographs of all 562 plus indigenous territories in the United States. So let's listen to her story. So this is from Unreserved with uh, Rosanna Dear Child. It's on CBC Radio. Of it. All right. So this is a clip from the first episode. And in it, we're just kind of really getting to know the hosts. And here, Matika Wilbur talks about her past work as a fashion photographer and how she shifted her focus into capturing Indigenous subjects. I studied photography in school and advertising. And I, I did like we all do when we go through a commercial program. I uh, was trained to become a photographer that makes money. And I remember, distinctly remember one of my professors saying to me, well, if you want to make money, you should photograph more white people because you need skinny white women, a lot of them in your portfolio if you want to work. That's what I did. And so when I graduated from college, I had this, I had this portfolio of really, uh, really skinny white women, essentially. <laughs> and, and then I went to Los Angeles and I started working in advertising and celebrity photography. And, and I remember this one day I was getting off on Sunset in La Brea and I looked up at this, at this ad that I had created. And it was this woman who, when we photographed her, was crying on set because she was so hungry. And I was like, girl, it's not a big deal. I'll get you some carrots. You know, like we have beautiful catering. And she was like, oh, no, I don't. I don't eat. I don't eat before photo shoots. And I, and I just remember thinking, like, I can't believe I'm participating in this. And then I looked up at the ad a couple of months later and it said, live the life you've always wanted. And I immediately quit my job. And I did like you're supposed to do when you're having a sort of uh, existential early life crisis. I went to South America. <laughs> and I traveled around. I got to meet a lot of really great indigenous people photographing them. And, and it was there when I was there working with indigenous folks that I had this realization that I hadn't even photographed my own people. That was Adrian okay. Keene. And so um, here we can see how indigenous people can become complicit uh, with the colonizers' knowledge and social practices. But um, uh, this also shows it's possible to become critical about such hegemonic knowledge. Sorry. So another similar um, example is in this uh, TV documentary about Mr. Haruzo Urakawa, an Ainu man, and uh, his daughter Makiko. So um, uh, Mr. Urakawa uh, was born in 1938, and uh, he worked uh, in the field ever since um, the age five, and he became a breadwinner of the house, uh, of the family, um, when he was in junior high school. He went to Tokyo uh, to work, and um, at the age of 45, and he uh, established a company, and he uh, became a leader among Ainu people uh, in Tokyo area. So Ainu Neno An Ainu, uh, the title of this documentary, meaning uh, means um, humanly human. So here's Makiko, uh, uh, his daughter. So after she gradu graduated from high school, uh, she left the um, the town and she went to Tokyo. Uh, she lived by herself and she covered um, her identity as Ainu. Um, she was ashamed of uh, being Ainu and she um, uh, worked for uh, so many jobs and she got married, but then uh, she lost everything at the age of 38 and uh, she became ill. So she uh, went to her um, father for the first time since um, she left home. And um, there was uh, Indigenous Peoples Summit um, in Hokkaido in 2008. Um, so her father asked her to make mantanpushi, which is a headband. And um, she started to make a headband and she became really um, uh, happy and she enjoyed making it. And then she uh, became uh, really proud of uh, being Ainu. So it's a um, very similar story. 
Um, this is a commercial. <laughs> this is not about, um, you know, our talk, but um, I don't know if uh, any of you have read it. Um, this is a novel um, that won the Naoki Show, Naoki Literary Award last year, and um, it's called Netsugen, and it's about um, Ainu in Sakhalin and um, uh, Polish uh, ethnographer, and it's based on a true story, and it's a wonderful novel. So I highly recommend um, that you read this. Okay. So now I'd like to um, show you an example of how the meaning of racism can appear in teaching material and how it can be challenged or unchallenged. So um, this is a textbook um, for teachers of English as an additional language. And this is a sample reading passage to show how to teach reading, okay? Um, okay, so it says the uh, California gold rush began on January 24th, 1848 in blah, blah, blah. And then these uh, early gold seekers who were called 49ers sailed around the tip of South America or across the US continent in covered wagons uh, through hostile Native American lands. So the uh, problem that I see is the racist um, uh, description of Native Americans as hostile. So it's uh, clearly uh, written from the settlers' perspective. Another problem is the fact that all the comprehension uh, questions uh, down here are um, uh, uh, what's called display questions or the questions that elicit factual answers from the text rather than referential questions or open-ended questions that invite students to exercise their critical thinking. So the author points that out too and suggests that referential questions should be asked. And an example uh, listed would be would you travel through hostile Native American territory to find gold? Why or why not? Okay, this was written on the um, bottom of this page, uh, which you don't see. Um, so um, that would further uh, reinforce racist meaning. Um, but a more critical question maybe, uh, what would Native Americans have thought about 49ers and why? Or what have, uh, what have been the effects of these white settlers westward travel for Native American people? So now after reading this chapter with the students um, in my um, uh, teacher education course, I uh, contacted the author because I knew her and uh, expressed my concern. So the author said by email, I understand. I will try to change it in our next edition of the book. And this is what happened in the next edition. Okay, so it says the same here um, in the beginning. And then it says these early gold seekers were called 49ers, blah, 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 um, uh, crossed the US continent in uh, covered wagons uh, under difficult and sometimes life threatening circumstances. Okay, so. Is this better or worse? It's good that um, there's no negative uh, depiction of Native Americans anymore. However, the entire reference to them has been deleted, uh, which takes away the uh, opportunity for students to understand an important part of the story. So which is better, a passage with um, racially problematic phrase or a sanitized colorblind text? Is it appropriate to avoid any reference to race and racism? So um, what kind of pedagogical principles do we need to consider in teaching? Here, I will propose uh, some ideas in terms of pedagogical principles and anti-racist education. So as uh, for pedagogical principles, uh, first, um, in our teaching uh, practices and materials, 
it's necessary for us to notice how certain race, gender, sexual orientation, language varieties, and so on are not represented, overrepresented, or misrepresented. Second, we need to critically reflect on our own biases. And third, um, we must strive to uh, integrate the various types of diversity, including race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and uh, so on in instruction. And fourth, um, we need to know that uh, there's no single um, uh, right answer to all these difficult um, issues and questions. Therefore, critical reflection is always required. So uh, in terms of anti-racist education, first, uh, we must recognize that racism exists. Erasing racist, racist meaning in the case of that um, ESL reading uh, material or denying that a certain act was not racist or discriminatory in the case of Mr. Motegi's comment does not um, help our recognition of racism. Second, we need to know that the system of oppression is uh, produced and reproduced by the interlocking operations of various identity categories, including race, gender, class, language, sexuality, age, and so on. Third, um, we need to acknowledge that uh, racism is not just about individual insult, but also ingrained in social structures and our knowledge system. And fourth, um, we need to recognize that we are privileged settlers of color or white settlers um, who must acknowledge that uh, we are occupying the unceded land. We must continue to work towards affirming human dignities and correct, um, correcting past mistakes and pre uh, present inequalities. So finally, um, uh, we need to know uh, that adding more colors to our faculty or students uh, does not necessarily lead to anti-racism. I didn't have time to elaborate on this, but uh, we often think that um, increasing uh, the diversity of faculty, staff, and students would lead to anti-racism. However, uh, we people of color are not um, necessarily anti-racism. So Asians as model minorities may hold racist attitudes towards other racialized people. And there are racist animosities against each other within Asian groups. So we sometimes lose sight of what our real enemy is. So it's time for us to unite and work towards common goal. Thank you very much. That um, concludes my uh, presentation. So if you have any questions, please um, email me um, and um, let's um, continue our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Nuko. I want to invite everyone um, to raise questions either through the chat or um, to uh, put on your, your video or your audio or both. Um, uh, ideally the audio for sure, uh, so we can um, hear questions, comments, feedback. I know we have many language um, educators with us here today uh, and many graduate students as well and uh, many people teaching in, in other capacities. Uh, and so uh, I'll leave it open and, and um, welcome you to ask about any aspect of that. We've covered uh, a lot of ground from uh, multi-layered forms of discrimination to linguistic stereotyping and profiling, um, many forms of racism and how that shapes our views and experiences, thinking about textbooks and how they inform our teaching uh, and different ways in which they represent knowledge, thinking about modes of success or learning um, and ways in which teaching can be made open-ended. And then Dr. Kubota left us with some strategies at the end in terms of thinking through pedagogy. Um, and reflecting on biases, noting representation, uh, what is there, what isn't there, what may be over or underrepresented, um, thinking about 
ways in which diversity can be integrated into our instruction and critically reflecting on it. Uh, and then taking an anti-racist approach in terms of recognizing um, the existence of racism in what, what we do and um, intersectionality and how that functions uh, and recognizing the way that racism wends its way through um, social structures and knowledge systems through um, our teaching practices and then thinking about our own position as um, in my case, a white settler here on occupied land. So questions or, or queries about any aspect of that. Can I stop sharing? Yes. Sure, we'll welcome everybody else, thanks. Hi, um, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Ryuko Sensei, for your presentation. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, there has been a lot of, uh, um, to the best of my knowledge, there has been a lot of research on um, English textbooks and how like race and, and uh, identity, uh, especially like characters um, in those textbooks are depicted. Um, However, like I haven't really encountered any like a critical assessment of Japanese textbooks, how, you know, like all the uh, characters in, uh, appear in the textbooks, they're mostly like white um, male or female um, students who came to Japan and then they talk about like experiences um, that's normally on the dialogues, but, um, I'm just wondering, like, is, has there been any like extensive research uh, focusing on Japanese textbooks in relationship to um, how they treat like race, gender, and et cetera? Yeah, thank you very much for the great question. Um, as far as I know, I haven't seen any research on that. So uh, I think it's time for us to start um, analyzing textbook. I showed um, some pictures from Yoko so Nakama and Genki. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I just looking at the, um, I think uh, there's one in Yoko so there's John Kawamura, I guess John Kawamura, a Japanese uh, Canadian or Japanese American. Um, but then rest of them, I don't know, Heather Gibson, I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell because um, the textbooks are all black and white. Um, so, um, but it, it just seems for Genki, uh, Robert Smith, uh, British and Mary Hart, American, um, they look uh, Caucasian. Um, yeah, there's um, Korean student, but um, yeah, so that's um, so that's very interesting. Yeah, actually, I'm teaching a third level Japanese, and then we're using uh, the textbook called uh, um, Chukyu no Nihongo. Yes, and then those te that textbook also uh, has characters. Um, they're mostly uh, students. Uh, exchange students in, in to Japan, mm -hmm. but they're like American. They're all American and then they're all white. Mm -hmm. So um, when we were teaching a, a class like a daily basis, we're not really, we don't really have a chance to question like how the textbooks or like textbook makers, um, you know, actually approach the, the production of these textbooks. So um, yeah, that's something that I, I'm very curious. And also this is something that we may have to have more research on. <laughs> Yes, um, yeah, I think it would be very interesting to unpack that uh, with the students, maybe um, you can pose some questions and then um, sort of analyze the, the visual images uh, with the students. I think it would be very interesting, um, interesting uh, task uh, to, to, to pursue. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a whole number of questions in the chat. Um, I'll take two of the, I'll, I'll convey two of the broader ones uh, and then uh, time permitting, we can get to the more specific ones. 
Um, the first question is, uh, can you share any practices that you use to apply um, to increase students' awareness of racism in your classes? So how, how do you approach this um, in teaching? Mm -hmm. um, again, there's no um, you know, single answer or right answer. So I think we need to um, just be creative and flexible. And um, sometimes uh, we have to grab the opportunity, um, but sometimes we can um, plan on something, some activities and so forth. Um, so raise students' awareness of racism. So that um, issues of textbook um, that um, uh, Hoshi Sensei just uh, mentioned is um, one uh, uh, issue that um, students can engage in. Uh, maybe um, other um, like you know reading newspaper articles um, if it's like a more higher level uh, class. Um, for um, more beginning level class, um, yeah, maybe um, really deconstructing the images that um, are portrayed in the textbooks uh, about the uh, illustrations and also the content of it. So um, I think there are many um, creative ways to raise those um, issues with the students. I, I'm sorry, I can't be too uh, specific um, because I don't know your um, specific context, but um, if you have any you know, um, further questions uh, to discuss, um, just uh, email me and we can um, sort of put our heads together and um, think about some good activities. And then uh, the next question is um, related to ways in which this, you can incorporate critical content-based language teaching at the elementary level. I think often when we think about this, we think about it at intermediate or advanced levels, and it becomes easier to imagine ways of doing that. Um, but particularly at the elementary level, are there strategies you recommend or approaches, uh, or have you seen creative ways of approaching that? Okay, thank you. Um, this summer, uh, I was invited to uh, present with uh, two other Japanese language teachers in high school um, to do webinar for A ATJ, the American Association for Teachers of Japanese. I think um, the video should be on the, um, on the web, A ATJ website. But um, one of the teachers actually uh, talked about how she um, uh, used um, self-introduction um, as a way to uh, disrupt uh, stereotypes. So, um, so that might be an interesting resource that uh, you can take a look at. Um, so um, for example, uh, let me see. Like, you know, I am from Japan, but I don't like sushi or something like that. Um, uh, that could be a little bit problematic, but um, uh, you can take a look and see uh, what you can adapt. Um, and um, and um, so that, that's one example. Another example might be, again, I take a look at all these um, uh, illustrations in the textbook and unpack that uh, racial uh, images, racial meanings. Um, and also maybe um, I talked about um, sports, different sports and racial representations. That, that would be a very interesting topic to discuss even maybe in um, uh, elementary level, um, beginning level, um, maybe some of the deeper level discussion needs to be done in English, but at least um, with some um, vocabulary, um, they can start thinking about those, so. Great, and then we have another question um, about um representation of race and in addition to representations of race, race and ethnicity in textbooks, it would also be useful to think about the structure of language progression and embedded levels of expectation as well. So the Genki textbooks fall far short maybe on the representation of diversity 
Um, and particularly because it sets up a kind of heteronormative romance narrative that's really the basis of the book. And yet other texts, like in this uh, example, given the Marugoto texts are far more diverse to a certain extent about race and nationality. Um, and yet students are not expected to learn any kanji at all until the second level. Um, and then integration of characters is slow. And so this, this creates a low expectation for a development of literacy. So we see these kind of many layers of problems. Um, and this is just a comment to get us thinking about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we need to um, think about uh, various kinds of uh, normative ideologies, not just you know race, um, but language, um, you know, sexual orientation, um, gender, and all these things. So, yeah, thank you for the comment. We have another question um, related to your um, article on race, culture, and identities in second language education, introduction to research and practice. Um, and you suggest that teachers ask ourselves um, what teaching methodologies are deemed more legitimate and what uh, epistemologies are they based on? Can you give us an example of a teaching methodology that challenges epistemological racism? Uh, teaching strategy. What kind of methodologies Me should methodology. be brought to the fore? Uh, teaching methodology, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> teaching methodology, um, epistemological. So um, all these things are not a really like, you know, um, uh, they don't, uh, we don't have like a set strategies or set methodology um, of how we are supposed to do things, right? Um, as I mentioned, um, there are so many different ways of addressing these issues and um, we can be very creative and um, we make mistakes, but um, you know, we always make mistakes. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. And um, um, for epistemological uh, racism, again, it's the, you know, racism in our head and, um, so some of the um, you know descriptions of Japanese culture may be really geared towards um, the um, you know traditional uh, the watching the uh, you know the, the majority Japanese people. Um, so I think um, critical questioning is very important. Why is this um, like uh, this way? And um, uh, so for example, I used to do this. Um, let me see, it was about um, the New Year's um, uh, traditional uh, food, right, uh, cuisine. Um, so for example, um, even like ozoni, ozoni is the, um, uh, the rice, uh, sticky rice in soup, right, that um, a lot of people eat uh, for uh, New Year's in Japan. Um, and you know that's supposed to be the traditional Japanese food, um, but then there there's a lot of you know variations of the recipe, um, and um, and actually ozoni doesn't exist uh, traditionally in Okinawa, and then uh, you know we, we can talk about the history of Okinawa and why um, you know it doesn't exist there. Um, the issue of colonialism and you know all these things um, can be discussed um, by just looking at a very simple thing like food, right? So um, my suggestion is um, just take a very simple thing like food, sport, um, I, um, I don't know, transportation, whatever, and um, think about um, issues of diversity and also um, who is um, excluded from this, um, who is included, and what is the history, what are the ideologies behind um, all these, um, you know, representations and practices. So um, that's, um, that's my recommendation. Thank you. Uh, and then maybe in closing, there's two interrelated questions, or at least I think they related in, in some way. Um, so early on, we had this question of that example you gave of a reporter, Magdalena Osumi. Um, for those who weren't um, catching all the, the Japanese, 
um, the question is, well, you know, is this an issue of, of speaking an accented Japanese or in, in a way that's per, somehow perceived as less fluent? Um, and can you speak to that? And I think this also um, uh, touches on a broader issue of what, what is perceived as sort of fluent or not in Japanese uh, and how that, that um, impacts different forms of, of discrimination. Uh, and then I think a related question, um, I'd like to find some more examples of non-Japanese looking people, uh, particularly people of color speaking Japanese for use in the classroom. It's hard to find these materials from Japanese sources because often the Japanese speech of non-native Japanese speakers is portrayed as funny or substandard in Japanese. So I'm wondering if you have advice on finding good sources or if anybody else does. Uh -huh. Okay, so the second question, I found that, um, you know, 7-Eleven Japan uh, website, which was uh, really interesting to me because, you know, all these are um, non-native speakers of Japanese and, you know, they're all uh, very fluent, right? And um, and those, um, I think there are many other materials maybe um, on the uh, uh, internet. So maybe you can find some uh, materials and then, um, you know, talk about uh, all these accents um, or, you know, how um, they're uh, really um, fluent um, and, um, but then how they be treated um, and so forth, right? Um, so I think it's a matter of trying to find something because um, there's a wealth of uh, materials on the, um, on the internet. Um, this first question, um, so I think it's a combination of, to me, um, is language, gender and race, right? Um, she does speak uh, speaks um, speak um, Japanese with an accent, um, um, but again, uh, if it was asked by a white man, a white male reporter, I'm not too sure if um, you know he would uh, switch to English. Um, I'm not. I, I doubt that he would speak, switch to English if the reporter was speaking Japanese as the second language, um, but then uh, the reporter was from Asian background, right? So um, my point is that um, all these reactions are um, really influenced by the multi-layered, um, you know, influences of uh, or intersectionality uh, involving race, gender, um, language, and so forth. So, um, yeah, I, and, you know, we don't know, actually, um, what really triggered, um, you know, his reaction. Um, it, it's really hard to, hard to know, but um, if we, um, you know, observe people the way um, they react and um, observe different um, circumstances, um, the way they re uh, respond to other people, um, we can kind of guess um, what's going on. So, um, yeah, so that's my answer to the first question, and I hope that's, um, that um, it's okay. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you've given us a lot to reflect on and, and, and uh, such a rich presentation. And so I really wanna thank you for all of the preparation for thinking about ways in which uh, we can move on and, and, um, uh, and make language classrooms better. I wanna thank everyone for, for joining us, but let me in closing pass this to uh, our head, Sherilyn Orba. Thanks, and thank you so much, Duco. I've learned a lot from your work in the past, and I learned a lot from what you had to tell us today. And it was so so practical and so nitty gritty. I really appreciated that. Um, and it helped me to think about things that I can do in my classroom, even though I'm not teaching language anymore. I also thought it was really useful the way, uh, because when I think about race and intersexuality, I think about things like race, gender, class, nationality, that sort of thing. But language is also, such an integral part of that whole um, intersectional identity that each of us has. And um, bringing that into our thinking about race, I think really enriches the discussion in, in all kinds of different directions. So thank you very much. Thanks to everybody who came. Thank you all for the wonderful questions. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Good night.
tonight. Thank you very much.